Our topic today is cultural change, representation, and the power of influencers. And we're having a conversation with Sean Skelly. We are also joined today by uh, Dean Ayers. We're delighted she can uh, join today and show support for this event and for the work we're doing. Uh, and let me now turn things over to my colleague, uh, the distinguished professor Arturo Sotomayor, and he will take it from here to introduce uh, our guest and to moderate today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chris Cochin, for that introduction. And thank you also for allowing us to use the leap space to have this important conversation today. I'd like to welcome all our attendees, our Dean, of course, and all people who have joined us today to have this very important conversation. Before I proceed to introduce our wonderful speaker today, I'd like to make three brief announcements. First is that, as you will notice, you're muted and your camera will be off, but we would like to invite all our participants to join us in this conversation and to post your questions using the chat room. We look forward to looking at questions. The way we will proceed will be as follows. We will have a brief conversation between me and Sean during the first 20, 30 minutes. And then we hope to be able to open the floor for questions posed through the chat room. And I will gladly read your questions. The second thing I'd like to say is I'd like to recognize all the co-sponsors for today's event. I especially want to thank Out in National Security for helping us sponsor this event, as well as the SBS Student Board, the Gender Equality Initiative in International Affairs, JAIA, the Elliott School Diversity and Inclusion, the Multicultural Student Service Center here at GW, and the Milken Institute School of Public Health. Thank you so much for supporting this event and for making it possible and advertising it widely in newsletters. And finally, my third announcement before I introduce our speaker is a statement that I think is necessary and indispensable. The George Washington University gives voice to our, value, to our values of diversity, equity, and inclusion by welcoming all transgender students, staff, faculty, alumni, and members of the community, as well as partners. We recognize, celebrate, and support the unique contributions that people with transgender identities and experiences offer our campus community and the GW educational experience. All transgender people have a home at GW and the Elliott School, so we salute you all. All right. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, who really deserves no, that really needs no introduction, but nevertheless, I would like to highlight a few things about her career and the reasons why we invited her. Sean Skelly is a co-founder of Out in National Security and served on active duty in the U.S. Navy for 20 years as a Naval Flight Officer, retiring with the rank of Commander. She joined the Obama administration in 2013 as the first transgender veteran to be appointed by a president of the United States. She first served as special assistant to the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology and Logistics at the US Department of Defense, and ultimately as a director of the Office of the Executive Secretariat at the US Department of Transportation. In 2017, President Obama appointed her to serve as commissioner on the National Commission on Military, National, and Public Service, which submitted its final report to Congress in March of 2020, a year ago. Sean was recognized as one of a group of transgender veterans in the 2017 Out 100. Sean, thank you so much for being with us. We're delighted to have you here and welcome to the Elliott School. How are you? Sean, can you can you listen to us? Oh, Sean may be having some technical issues. Hi, Sean. And we apologize. It's the inconvenience of technology. Hi, Sean. Can you listen to us? Hey, Sean. Yes, we can hear you. How are you? I can hear you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being with us and welcome to the Elliott School. I'm good. Thank you. Um, apologies for that. 
<laughs> no worries. Thank you we for all... having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's such an esteemed institution and series of uh, speaker series. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, let's begin with our conversation. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we know that one of the first measures taken by the current administration of President Biden was precisely an executive order lifting the Pentagon's ban on transgender people serving in the military. And this was one of his first signature events during the first week of his administration. Do you mind reflecting on the significance of that measure and why it matters for our national security? I'd be happy to, Arturo. Thank you. Um, first, I'd say, I, by happenstance, it turns out that I was asked by CSIS to write a piece on uh, transphobia and national security, which happened to come out just a few days before the election. Um, and so anything I'm saying on that topic is found in a little bit greater detail um, on that piece in the CSIS Represent series, which I was honored to ask to be a part of. Um, when I look at the what you know, colloquially, um, you know, known as the ban and the removal of it, the direction to remove it. Um, I think of it in, in, the, in three ways. Um, first, with regard to uh, those serving transgender service members, um, because the issue was um, almost no, maybe one or two um, trans Americans were, um, had, had been able to uh, enlist or uh, join as an officer. Um, before the ban was in place by the Trump administration. So the issue really centered around uh, those successfully serving um, people in the armed forces um, who had transitioned and were or seeking to transition um, while already being in service. Um, that imposition of that ban was a direct insult to their service and to them as individuals and as Americans. Um, the whole point of them being there was that they were in the middle of successful careers and they had been given permission to transition. They did so. Testimony by chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, two of them, um, multiple service chiefs, um, all said that those who had transitioned in the early days, the first year, two, two plus years um, following the Obama policy to allow people to transition and serve, that there was not a single problem with folks and it had no impact on our military readiness. And then through uh, the president himself and the Trump administration, um, they then essentially backwards engineered a rationale to make the claim that th those people were a detriment to military effectiveness to their units, um, that they were abnormally uh, out of service and unable to deploy um, in the jargon of that, of that administration and the department at that time. Um, all of which was fallacious. It was just an insult to them. Um, you know, it flew in the face of all the studies that had been done prior worldwide, flew in the face of, of the professional medical opinions of the Amer American Medical Association, Psychiatric Association, Psychological Association, three former Surgeons General of the United States and three former Service Surgeons General, all found that there was nothing to any of the claims about the the, uh, the lack of effectiveness or impact. Um, they made ludicrous claims about the cost of having transgender service members when it's actually less than the cost of what the what the Department of Defense spends on Viagra in a year, you know, to put it in stark relief. You know, it's, it's a, it was a multi-decimal place rounding error on the defense health budget. Um, so it was about reversing that insult and injustice to their service. Um, the second one was about the place of trans Americans writ large, that yes, transgender Americans do create people who want to serve and are capable of serving. You know, trans people are found throughout society, you know, all demographic slices, vertical, horizontal, you name it, there are LGBTQ people to include trans people in those places. And in general, as we know that uh, when we look at the, the US population and their ability to meet the basic qualifications of military service, only about 29% of Americans meet those qualifications. Um, and that will include that's and that's the same for both women and men. So that means trans people are right there too, just as capable capable uh, that segment of our society creates just as many Americans who are capable of answering the call if they want to. We presently have a volunteer force, so people have to step forward or be receptive to recruitment into the force. And um, there's there's nothing to suggest that trans people are any less 
less likely to do so or that are less capable of doing so. Um, and so that was an important signal as to who trans people are in America. Because honestly, uh, the, the Trump administration went on an administration wide campaign against the place of trans people in America. Virtually every department and agency changed their policies, changed rules to remove discrimination against trans people at every place. From the Department of Justice and its Bureau of Prisons, Department of Education, obviously the Department of Defense, everywhere that they could, they took negative actions against the place, the safety and the welfare of transgender Americans. I think that um, taking actions against transgender service members was a, was, a, was a core component of that. Because if you want to deny someone access to housing or allow people to deny them access to housing while using federal funds, they best not be a veteran because Americans are not going to stand for, a vet, for veterans to be abused. So you know, my premise is, and I believe it's probably well-founded, if you keep making transgender veterans, you can't abuse transgender people because you're going to wind up hitting a veteran and America is going to push back on that. If you can produce a veteran, because it's been a historical um, mechanism for inclusion in American society, not just for individuals to serve in uniform, but for, for individuals from every immigrant class we've had, when Black Americans answered the call, in World, excuse me, in the Civil War, World War One, World War Two, Japanese Americans answered the call while being interned and performed remarkably in World War II, um, the integration of women into the force, every time it's helped to um, advance the cause, the place, the acceptance of people as full participants in American society, um, and all the immigrants who oftentimes in various wars step off the boat and then step into uniform in American history. Um, trans people benefit from that effect as well. And uh, third, I think that was important. It's about the future of our public service in any of its forms, civil servants at state, federal, local levels, military service. Um, we need people to, to serve us as citizens. As Lincoln said, it's a government of the people, by the people, for the people. That means people have to step forward and do it and want to do it and feel like it's something worthy of their time and to become their vocation, not just a job. And that becomes a problem for Gen Z when in the 21st century we decide as a federal government that some slice of America is not worthy when the vast majority of people can see right through it that it's more about other, fed by bigotry, fear, or partisan gain of whatever, of whatever type, and that, that um, negatively affected the attractiveness public service for the rising generations that we need as a public to serve all of us. You know, in any, I like my, I like my roads paved. I like my drinking water clean. I like my um, mass transit safe. I like my food and drugs to be safe. Um, all of those things are done by public service. And if you just told a rising generation, you know, uh, the youngest um, millennials and the rising Gen Z generation that segments of the population, their friends, their family members, um, are not welcome and are less than, they're, they're going to be reluctant to serve. So I think it was a signal as to um, how the Biden administration, not just viewed the place of transgender Americans, which is fairly obvious in, in um, now President Biden's campaign statements and actions up to the election and after, um, but um, about the place of everybody having an opportunity. Everyone's worthy, everyone can be, everyone is an American who's entitled to it and that we should not single anybody out on dual. Yes, and thank you so much for your answer. And, you know, our, our audience might not be aware of the fact that the Department of Defense is the largest employer of transgender people, not only in the United States, it is estimated that it's the largest employer of transgender people in the world. Um, a, st a study that was conducted in 2014 indicated that there were approximately 15,000 transgender men and women already serving in the military. And that's in addition to the almost 150,000 trans Americans who are veterans. Um, and so it is the largest employer. And um, the reason why it's so important is because if we can change policies within the Department of Defense, we can certainly change it in other places. That, that's an excellent point, Arturo. Um, it, yeah, because it is the largest employer in the United States. The number of people on military contracts and that are, that are employees, let alone the number of um, private sector 
employees who are paid by the Department of Defense. It's immense. So the influence of the department upon a good slice of the American public is is not to be um, misunderstood. Um, and what what was interesting um, in that the Trump administration's efforts to stick it to trans people in many departments, the shoe that never really dropped was Veterans Affairs, which kind of puts proof uh, to the principle that they were reluctant to take it to serve, you know, honorably <laughs> served veterans who received care. They didn't extend the full care that was wanted for trans veterans, but they didn't do anything to take it back. And they actively promoted the services that they offered transgender veterans. So they didn't go all the way to what was frankly is required, but they didn't try to claw anything back or signal them out and single them out. And I thought that was a pretty significant signal that they knew that it's, it's a no go to screw with veterans, which is why you had to stop making them. Yeah, and now, of course, some analysts might say, well, the ban has been lifted. There is an executive order that now bans the discrimination against uh, transgender soldiers. There's a ruling by the US Supreme Court of Justice uh, last year in June uh, preventing discrimination in the workforce. Um, and, and so the question here, well, is, is that enough or do we need to do something else to prevent discrimination against transgender soldiers and transgender public officials? Um, that's a question that can't, I think it, it goes to the, to the bigger question of not just transgender people, but any slice of American society. Um, and what can justify singling, singling them out and making them, treating them differently? Um, and it gets to be a, a, a little, a little bit of a slippery slope when it comes to who deciding who's fit for military service. Um, which was one of the issues with there are still, I believe the court cases against the ban are still pending because they're waiting for resolution and federal courts don't move especially fast most of the time. Um, because generally the courts defer to the executive branch to determine because of the powers and, you know, um, set in the executive branch for to make war with Congress's blessing and the funding, but as to how to do it, largely represent, largely lies in the executive branch to include who is fit to serve and why in that way. Um, I personally, I believe and concur with uh, what I've heard from some members of Congress who think the best approach is to um, describe, um, the, uh, to write into law, um, something with regard to a broader uh, non-discrimination clause that, that anything to do with military fitness to serve has to be founded in fact and be defensible and be transparent as to why someone has to be a certain height, a certain weight, um, have a certain test score for a certain specialty and the like. Um, that discretion needs to lie within the professionals in the executive branch that are chosen, selected by the president to execute that responsibility. But at the same time, um, wantonly deciding there aren't going to be any people of this eye color, this hair color, this ethnic background or whatever, there's there's no proof that that makes a difference. Anybody of any segment is capable of producing particular individuals who meet the standard of and, and are able to qualify that you have to be able to run so fast, that you have to be able to lift so much in particular circumstances in that way. Um, and you have to have a certain mental acuity and the like to be able to perform certain tasks. That those that would be standards based and it not have this relatively arbitrary discretionary power that was obviously abused in the case of uh, the Trump administration's attempt to ban transgender individuals from serving. Now, with regard to civil officials, I think Bostock will rule the day and federal executive orders can do a lot of it because, again, the workforce falls underneath the executive branch, though, with congressional oversight, but much of it's in OPM regulation. It's in there. And, uh, in, I think in most, I'm, def, I'm the, the least lawyerly person you'll meet, um, but my understanding is the court has ruled in Bostock, and now it's going to, the, how it's going to be rounded out and applied in multiple particular instances is going to take some time as, case, as cases are brought, citing Bostock as justification as to um, the discrimination of LGBTQ people. So, but it, it, it's pretty sound, it's pretty broad, it's like you can't, you can't do it based on LGBTQ status. 
So I think in the main, civilian employees are being on solid ground because the, it, it readily covers them um, in that way. But um, military, any legal action will probably be needed to be a bit more broader, non-discrimination than that any, any action would have to be very specific and very well founded and, and totally transparent. Absolutely. And I think we often take for granted that when we push for either legislation or for court rulings regarding protections of vulnerable people and everyone, we're really actually helping everyone else, uh, right? It's, it's not just the trans community or the members of the LGBTQ community is that we're really shielding everyone else from discriminatory practices, which is why it's so fundamental that we have legislation that protects against discrimination, both in and outside of the armed forces. Um, and again, I'd like to invite all our attendees that if you would like to post a question for our guests to please do so by uh, using the chat room. Um, Sean, do you mind if we move towards your leadership? Uh, um, because in, in 2019, you and, and other partners um, took the initiative to create a new group out in national security. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this organization and what inspired you to create this group and become really a public and a vocal voice for this particular community? Thank you for the opportunity to talk about out in national security, Arturo. Um, and I will say for folks, um, we're on the, out in national security is on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and a website um, can be contacted through all those organizations out in national, all those platforms, excuse me, out in national security.org. Um, it, it started with conversations. Oh, it's myself, my dear friends and uh, former Obama administration um, colleagues, um, Luke Schleusner and Rusty Pickens. Um, I worked in DOD and DOT. Um, Luke worked in the White House and DOD. Rusty worked in the White House and Department of State, and our paths crossed. Um, and um, it grew from a conversation that we had ourselves um, in the second term of the administration towards the end um, about what the experience had been. The Obama administration had been transformative for the place of LGBTQ people in government. Um, it was the first serious numbers, the, the first occurrence of serious numbers of presidential appointees who were LGBTQ appeared in the Obama administration. There had been folks who had been out in uh, a handful of folks who had been out um, in the Clinton administration. There had been high ranking uh, civilian out officials uh, led um, in the main by um, ambassadors at State Department who kind of led the way as to be publicly in the out. Um, Ambassadorial rank helps protect people to a degree, though it's, it's no magic shield. Um, and they did incredible things by uh, making their presence known with their mentorship and sponsorship of people. Um, and so there were a couple hundred LGBTQ appointees over the eight years of uh, the Obama administration. But um, we had our conversations about what, how can it be done better with regard to national security? And does the LGBTQ community itself, especially by being in DC and those incredible um, national advocacy organizations that have done so much to advance the place um, and the quality of life of LGBTQ people in America. And you know, in the nature of presidential politics and federal government, the interaction between um, civil society organizations and their advocacy with presidential administrations is one of the great things about American democracy when it's done for the right causes. Um, and we felt that there maybe was a gap as to those folks that advocate for LGBTQ folks and their understanding of what NATSEC is. It's not just an internet people with international relations degrees or knuckle dragger military types like me. Um, national security includes international finance. It's justice has pieces of that. You know, we're lawyers, lawyers are everywhere. Um, it's academia, it's the Department of Defense has a school system. The Department of Defense hires archaeologists. The Department of Defense has a medical system with hospitals around the world. Um, it needs scientists and engineers of all, of all types, um, people with all kinds of expertise. It's massive in some ways, really scary and sad. So much, it's such a massive endeavor. Um, but it requires all kinds of expertise. And that, as we know, LGBTQ people 
are everywhere and to be found in all fields, always have been, are today, and will be, despite the, the recognition or the understanding of who we were and how we refer to ourselves, and despite the oppressions that may be put upon us for just being who we are. It's always been so. Um, there are times when I've been on different um, chats so like this and things, and folks will pop in and say, this is all why are you forcing these new things? And this is experimentation. And this is what we're... you're just selling your you're selling yourself short or, or telling us who you are. But you don't realize that there have been trans people pretty well documented throughout the ages or, that we now refer to as trans people who served in uniform in the, in the history of America that were likely trans if, or 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 non or non-binary. Um, there have always been gay and lesbian people who have served in government and, and, and in the military. This is not new. What's new is we're just admitting who we are, that we're there, and that we're as capable as anybody else has been, because we always have been. You know, let's go back to Alexander the Great. You know, okay, we're done. Question's over. Um, right there. Um, but it was that, there, that national security is a much bigger thing, and it's um, so intersectional, um, and that we can be recruiting people to serve in presidential administrations who actually respect LGBTQ people um, earlier and more deliberately to help create a pipeline to ensure that it's more representative and it's properly representative of who, American, who Americans are in that way. Um, and then the 2016 election happened because initially we were just looking at um, having conversations with those people, those influencers, but then 2016 happened and LGBTQ Americans came to be assaulted by the federal government um, in, in many ways, some of us um, much less fortunate than others. Um, and eventually we came around to the fact that there was a gap in representation. Um, there are several other um, diversity, many diversity related groups within the national security firmament, um, group, groups representing women, people of color, um, and there seemed to be a space there with regard to the place of LGBTQ people. Um, so um, it shocked me. It's the most entrepreneurial thing I've ever been a party to. Um, and uh, we were welcomed very rapidly. Um, it hasn't even been two years for us yet now, um, but we stepped into a space that kind of uh, sucked us in like it was a vacuum. Um, and we've had the most incredible support and embrace from these groups that are. Um, represent women, that represent um, people of color, that represent black Americans. Um, it's been phenomenal. And also the embrace I've found that we step forward at a time when um, not just academic institutions, but um, some of the think tanks and the like, the policy organizations had come to realize they've been talking about LGBTQ rights overseas and the impact upon freedoms and, and the like in other countries and realized that they hadn't understood how those very issues at home play into American foreign policy and security policy to include the representation of those American voices in their own organizations. And the number of um, groups that we were in contact with and doing sub having substantive conversations, you know, nationally known, internationally known organizations that uh, pretty much put us in a headlock and said, help us please talk to us. Um, um, was really impressive and a little dizzy. Um, we're, we're still now almost two years old and starting to, um, our first dedicated fundraising effort to begin it in that way. I don't think we've spent anybody else's money except our own so far. Um, but thankfully, technology has allowed us to um, move forward. So it was really about trying to find, to add a voice or to help facilitate voices at this level here, because as LGBTQ people have been everywhere forever, um, we know that there are, in many places, there are LGBTQ organizations, whether they be in, in schools, um, undergraduate, graduate, um, there are professional organizations, there's no, there's no organization for, for LGBTQ people in international finance, and there's the LGBT bar with the national security section, all of those things. Um, if that includes the defense industry, their employee resource groups in, in those places, their employee resource groups related to some of the federal unions in national security organizations that look out for 
the place of um, LGBTQ employees. They don't talk to one another though. We're all on these pretty much, at least as groups, individually, sure, they cross paths, but as groups, um, we're sure about there on islands when it's really a Venn diagram that needs to be empowered. To just, those voices are there, but they sort of need to be processed and amplified and not filtered, um, not directed, but getting some help that these people are there. They've been there in that way. Um, that was the premise at this point. Well, you know, on, on behalf of the LGBTQ community, I really want to thank you for being a, a spokesperson, for taking on the microphone. Um, you are absolutely right that LGBTQ people exist in all spectrums and all different types of activities and endeavors. Um, I'm reminded of the fact I started my academic career in the Navy when there was still don't ask, don't tell. I don't think I was outspoken about my sexual orientation, but I think most people knew. But what I found remarkable back in, in those days was the number of Navy students who would come to my office and close the door and wanted to talk about their identity and how they felt. And so I'm so glad that you've created this group because it, it's, it was indeed a much needed and welcoming uh, group. And we're so thankful for, again, for, for being a voice person, for representing us publicly as well. If you don't mind. It's an honor. <laughs> If you don't mind, I'd like to invite one of our students, uh, David Delafoe, and maybe he can uh, unmute himself and also maybe he can show himself on the camera. Hey, sure, David, sure. he's a second year SPS student, and we don't have an LGBTQ student organization at the Elliott School, but we're working really hard. But yeah. David would like to ask you a question. David, please go ahead, unmute yourself, and uh, go ahead and make your question. Ms. Kelly, so I have a question. You know, in preparation for this, Professor Sotomayor and I have been talking, we have been reading articles, you know, and it seems that in the research that I've done, one of the uh, biggest things that people say, one of the bigger claims that people say is that transgender people will join the armed forces in order to get that free health care and be able to, you know, transition for free, you know, kind of like piggyback right off of the government. What are your responses to people who make these claims and how would you like, you know, this issue to be presented and understood by others? That is, thank you um, for your question, David, and thank you for what you're doing there um, with your leadership. Um, that is, to me, that's part and parcel of um, a statement I've heard a lot over the last um, 14, 15 years since I came to understand my, my authenticity and began to transition while serving. Um, so I was doing it in the closet under the table for years, for two years before I got out. Um, where, um, where one of my doctors, um, I, um, a man who I still see, I mean, my incredible privilege to see the same medical provider for. Um, for all this time to be able to do it. And, but um, he said, you know, he just offered, I think, I think trans people go in the military because they're dealing with their gender identity issues and that they want to cover it up. Trans women want to cover it up by being in the military and being tough. And I'm like, I thought flying airplanes off of aircraft carriage was incredibly cool and this was the only place I could do it. So that's why I took the, the plunge. And it took me seven years then to go do that, you know, go to school and training and everything like that. So it wasn't there for me. And I and I really don't subscribe to those sort of things um, with regard to identity. And, and it's really, there, there definitely there are some people who you know, try to wrestle with their feelings and try to, you know, go to the extreme of the expected norms with regard to identity in order to sort of in their struggle as, with who they are. Um, I don't begrudge them that you know, I actually have a, a friend of mine who I served with who was, um, who had more girlfriends than I could have ever imagined. And then as soon as he got out of the Navy, he, he came out as gay. Um, there are people who, who deal with that in different ways in their own struggles. Um, my personal appreciation is that with regard to the number of trans people who turn out to have a military background, I think it's what the military experience brings to a person in terms of getting to know yourself, what you're capable of, what real fear is 
what it's like to put your life on the line, potentially, you know, um, I, I had several close calls um, flying airplanes in the Navy, um, a couple very close calls. So I stared more, my mortality in the face um, in different ways, of either hours long limping a very broken aircraft back, hoping we we're gonna be able to make it to land and other times where it was a, a flash of a second, where like we almost just died there. Um, and you know, you're, and then you're wrecked for another couple hours to the adrenaline and the fear as to what happened beyond your control. Um, and so when it came time for me to deal with my authenticity, the question was, well, you know, I've dealt with this life or death junk before, and I know what I'm capable of, you know, and once it became clear to me that this is, this is the path to my, to my best life. It's not all, you know, rainbows and unicorns and, you know, hot and, hot and cold running chocolate all day. It's not, I'm a human being with all the frailties and problems we all have, but it's my, definitely my best life and my best chance by being my authentic self. Um, the thought of somebody going into the military and just in order to transition is reflexive and pretty well uninformed. Because guess what? As long as the Affordable Care Act is around, you can pursue care through that in most circumstances. Most, most Fortune 500 companies that offer um, comprehensive employee health care in, include gender-related care in their health plans. I think that this is the one and only place to see a haven to go. Number one, you have to be, because it's random, it's kind of chance for most people that you're one of the 29% that are qualified to even enter. You know, it's generally not your fault that you grew up in a, in a bad, you know, in a location that has an, an inadequate school system. So you might not test as well as is needed to join, or that you might have some sort of congenital health condition, or you might've been in an accident at some time, just, a car accident could injure, you know, the randomness of that could injure, injure you in a way that you might not then be able to qualify in the military. It's almost never, you know, some people, it's what they call moral problems that they uh, um, have, have uh, criminal records in the like, or somebody might have unfortunately got too much of their body tattooed to be acceptable that year um, in that way. But most of it is the fact that it's, it's a rare, less than one in three Americans can even do it. So, that you're navigating all these pathways and then you have to successfully get through recruit training. You have to successfully get through um, your initial professional training and then you have to be serving in order to get to that point. So you're gonna be willing to go on a multi-year journey to get to a place whereas if maybe you get hired by, you get hired and into a job or you get adequate healthcare coverage, it's already done. I think it's just another straw man as to these people aren't Americans because it's about who's considered American. Right. The highest ped pedestal in American society is our military. There's just a, uh, I saw it on Twitter yesterday. Um, I don't know if it's a definitive number, but um, the Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute um, did a poll. Um, 2,000 plus people, it looked pretty, pretty valid. Um, but that the, uh, the institution of the military, while still the highest one, most respected, um, took a 16 point hit. <laughs> It took a notch down, but it's still by far the most ex the most uh, respected institution related to government in America. So you know it, it's it's all part of the reason. If you're not the white male prototype, then you're less than. If you're not the male macho prototype, you're less than, and you diminish. You know the color of arms, and I just find that ridiculous. It's been disproven by history. They've got bigger issues. Thank you, Sean, and, and thank you, David, for your service. And um, so we do have uh, LGBTQ student organizations at the undergraduate level, but we're hoping that our students will create one at the graduate level. And uh, David, I wanna thank you for championing these issues. And if there's any other student who would like to support David and other students, please reach out to David. Uh, so thank you. Um, Sean, uh, I'm gonna read one of the questions that was forwarded to us by Francesca Salazar. And she asked a question very interesting. She says, thank you for your service, but she wants to know what can students, fellow veterans and community members do to be better allies to you and to help you, you know, with all the changes and challenges to empower the transgender community. 
Um, well, thank you for your question, Francesca, and what I think is the where I think is the uh, the caring contained in there <laughs> and the decency um, shown by your question. Um, from my personal experience, um, mine was kind of unique is with regard to my transition period, which I ex actually extended um, from my last couple of years in the military to my first couple of years in, in the civilian world and in the corporate world. Um, the thing that meant the most to me when it finally came time for other people to know where I was at um, in my journey, because they were going to find out, um, is the small kindnesses that come from showing another human being that you recognize them still as a human being with, with dignity and kindness. It's just the classic do unto others and treat people as you want to be treated. And I'll, there are, I could start rattling off names now of a handful of my colleagues because I, eventually, I personally eventually came out um, while working for a large defense contractor. And um, it was one <laughs> that um, didn't have a, a gender identity policy at that time because it was still relatively early days. Um, I never managed to get on to the, uh, to the human rights campaign um, Corporate index, which is a, which is a powerful tool to set standards, um, but the leadership of my company, the, the business unit I was in, decided, well, yes, we don't have gender identity policies, but we certainly have a very strong top level policy that every employee will be treated with respect by the company and by fellow employees, and that's going to be the bar and the standard. Um, and I was appreciative of that, and that really struck home for me. And it was the handful of employees I'd already been working with. Um, who just said, let me know if I can be of help. And our relationships continued as they did before. Because you could have been in orbit and seen that I was pretty stressed <laughs> during a particular period of time immediately before I needed to let people know in my, in my place of work what was going on and then the immediate after math uh, for several weeks and even months there on. And people that had been my friends before were then my friends again. People that I didn't work, a couple of people that I didn't work very closely with, but had good relations with, came forward to say, hi, let me know if you ever need anything. It didn't get overly invasive, overly intrusive. Didn't treat me as if I was a, you know, a little bird that had fallen out of the nest. But they just said, hey, good for you. And just let me know if you need anything and see you next week. I hope you don't screw up that thing you owe me. You know, it was like that. It's treating it as a matter of fact, it's just that you're another human being going through something in their life in that way. There's incredible power for that. And I think the other aspect of it is, um, is to be aware of how others are treating that person. You do care. Um, the, the slightest of interventions um, can have incredible impact if someone makes a disparaging remark once that trans person or anyone going through a situation leaves a room or before they come into a room and they're expected, you go, just don't, don't be that way. Don't make a comment about this. Don't make a comment about that. Not in front of me, you're not, you know, that way. But very early, simple interventions um, and demonstrations that that person's an outlier can be incredibly powerful in that way. And thank you, Sean, for inspiring all our students. Um, and indeed, I think your 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 comments is spot on. Um, you don't need to be gay to be an advocate of gay rights. You don't need to be transgender to be an advocate of transgender rights. That's why we call them allies and friends. Um, and the only thing we're asking is for you to treat us like human beings, because uh, we're all human beings. And at the end of the day, it's really about human rights. But uh, do know that uh, there are members of the LGBT community, as you said, everywhere. And also, I think it's also perfectly fine that if you know someone who is a member of the community, you can ask us questions as well. Uh, uh, and that can also be very useful. And, you know, you will earn empathy, sympathy, and compassion, which is the only thing we ask from our allies and friends. Um, do you mind if I, and, and if I ask you about your leadership as being the commissioner of the National Commission on Military, National, and Public 
uh, 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 service, which was a leadership position for which President Barack Obama uh, nominated you, and you served in that position from 2017 to 2020. Would you mind sharing us a little bit about your experience being the commissioner? And also the commissioner released its last report only last year and maybe share some of the highlights of their findings. Um, thank you, Arturo. Uh, yes, uh, our report came out um, two years, uh, excuse me, one year ago from Thursday. Um, and so, um, I happen to testify with regard to our report in front of the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee shortly after that. But uh, testimony, my colleagues testified in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee only two weeks ago. Um, it took the Armed Services Committee a year to get around to reviewing it. And they were the committee that um, sponsored the legislation which created um, the commission. I was one of 11 appointed commissioners, uh, one of the three that were appointed by President Obama in January of 2017. Um, we were 11 people appointed by nine different people, um, which made for an interesting mix, though we had a really incredible diversity of background with regard to different forms of military service of different duration, folks who were experienced in, in national service, things such as AmeriCorps and Peace Corps, as well as folks who were um, experienced with regard to uh, public service, serving as a civil servant. Um, we had an absurdly broad mandate. Um, the core issue was the issue of should women be required to register for the selective service and ultimately be eligible to be drafted into service in the time of a national security emergency? But that question was brought about by um, Defense Secretary Ash Carter in 2015, opening up the final military specialties directly related to ground combat, infantry, special forces, uh, I think armor uh, and the like, um, special operations, SEALs, all that, all that stuff uh, that are about 17 to 20 discrete positions that had not yet been open. Um, and as a result of that, lawsuits were filed saying, well, previous Supreme Court decisions had said women are excluded from the draft because they're not expected to serve in combat, which is actually a misreading of the law creating the draft, the, the authority to draft. It's just to build the military. It's not to put people into infantry, into trenches or whatever. It's just to staff the military. Um, so we had to answer that question, but then uh, the late Senator John McCain and uh, Senator Jack Reed added a, a broader dimension, which is examine what it means to serve America in any role, big, um, big role people serve every day as volunteers in soup kitchens or um, picking up trash on the side of the road, um, but federally supported programs. And um, they wanted to tack it on. So. Um, we had to come up with the, the logical through line of all those big and different things, looking at selective service, the potential to be conscripted into serving in, in the military, the all volunteer military force, because that has some significant demographic and recruitment problems with it in, in terms of the long-term vectors. Um, national service, which is AmeriCorps, which just received that additional billion dollars in the uh, American Rescue Plan, doubling its budget to get more people into that service that we've seen. As well as public service, the real problems with the federal civil service as a demographic bomb that's just ticking. We're up to a third of them can retire at almost at will in the next couple of years. And meanwhile, it is almost one third of the representation that exists in the private sector for people under 30. The federal workforce is 6% under 30. But meanwhile, the top third, which are all the leadership, could disappear within two or three years by dropping their retirement. That's no major corporation would accept such a workforce dilemma. But as we know, the federal government's really complicated. But we want to look at, um, are people aware of what they can do to serve their country and what it can do for them in all these different ways? And how do we get more of them to think about it, to want to explore it, to see that value, the potential value, and see it as a, a viable option in their consideration of what to do? Um, so we've been three years. Uh, we, um, Visited 42 cities, 22 states, um, 11, 11 public town halls, 14 public hearings, like a congressional hearing, several of them on C SPAN. I have my own C SPAN page and it freaks me out. Um, but what it came down to is that Americans are disposed to serve their country, to serve their fellow Americans. You know, we can each individually do it as I'm here to serve America, I'm here to do things for other people, 
but they're really one and the same. If you help your neighbors, you're helping the country. Um, whether that's like I did fly an airplane in the middle of nowhere over some ocean um, in the dark of night, or whether that's helping seniors with senior care um, or helping in classrooms and helping uh, children learn how to read and stay out of trouble. Um, they all matter to the fabric of society. Um, and what was really interesting, all the folks we talked to, we had all those things in a mission I talked about. And we said, so what's the issue? What's What are the gaps here, folks? What do you think issues? And people from all walks of life, recent high school and college graduates to mayors of towns and, and um, governors, and all kinds of um, average American citizens of all walks of life said it's civic education. Is that it's, it is lost out in the battle to STEM, which has been a multi decade clarion call about, you know, Americans are no good at math and science and we're losing the technological battles of the global economy. Um, not invalid. Um, there's problems with that. Public education is on its knees in America um, in many places writ large. Um, but as we looked into it, um, there are places where public education, excuse me, civic edu education is thriving. Um, there are also some incredible new models of the coupling of civic education and service learning, actually looking at your communities and doing something about it, teaching students how they can have an influence on their on their local environments for the better. Um, it's a fascinating statistic is the federal government applies $54 per student every year for STEM in all the different ways. It applies five cents per student for civic education. And we wonder why Jimmy Fallon or um, Jimmy Kimmel, I think is the one who does it uh, regularly in Los Angeles, goes out to Hollywood, um, with the Walk of Fame or whatever with the, with the stars in, in the in the uh, in the sidewalk and hits people up and says, "What are the three branches of government? You know, and the horrific failures. What's the capital of California? What's this? What's that? And the average American's civic knowledge is atrocious. The average Amer it's not the right barometer, but the average American um, fails the um, citizenship test. Right. That's not something you want to teach to. That's the first thing the expert said. Don't teach to that. But they don't have that basic level of knowledge as to how the system is supposed to work and their role in sustaining the system. What we really, really found it's about barriers, barrier to knowledge. We called it, we boiled it down. It's in our report, um, underrides our report, um, the three A's. It's awareness, aspiration, and access to opportunities. You have to know that something is there. It has to be introduced so you can, so that you can think about it, ponder it, have it in, have it up there for consideration with, I want to be, you know, I want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a social worker, whatever it is. And that, oh, by the way, I can do either these things in government or I, I just want to go and be a part of government. Um, then there's aspiration, being able to see that you can actually do it, see those models. Um, and then there's access because we know that some people have great advantage in seeking opportunities of all sorts, whether it be higher education or government service, because you come from a school that has cracked the code as to how to get a scholarship or a fellowship, and that puts you on the pipeline to maybe the foreign service or some other kind of federal service, for example. Where other folks are coming from places where they're probably not, they may not be adequately prepared for some of the tests that are there. Those individual people have the desire and have the inherent latent capability to do it, but they may not have the same advantage as other people out there. And all these barriers is to level people. The federal government doesn't recruit, it doesn't. It means it's a, it's a workforce of over a million people, which um, prorated has not changed in relative size to the American population since. The start of World War II, despite all the big bad government run amok, it's just as big relative to population as it was in 1940. Before the war even really kicked for America, the, the you know the arsenal of democracy hadn't really started firing in 1940 yet. Um, so there are a lot of preposterous statements out there. We don't advertise. We just whoever bothers to get their way through USA Jobs goes at it. They don't go out. They don't talk to students. Um, so it's really about it. It's really about activating that which exists across America and dispelling myths as to what it means to serve in the government or to serve in the military. Uh, thank you, Sean, for that answer and that comprehensive answer. Uh, we have a few minutes left, and I don't want to. Uh, I, I actually want to take. Uh, 
a, a question from one of our faculty members. You know, this this talk is being attended. It's been listened to by authorities, faculty, staff, and our faculty who teach students. And one of our faculty members is Professor Mike Purcell, who is himself a veteran. He served in the Marine Corps and teaches uh, Russia and international security. And he wants to know. Um, uh, w where can we find stories about trans veterans who served in previous generations? And where do you recommend to access these experiences and stories in writings or elsewhere? Um, um, first, um, Mike, thank you for your service in URA. Um, child of Marine in my last two and a half years in the Navy were attached to the Marine Corps. Um, that is a great question, and I don't have a link to throw to you, um, but one of my co-founders about national security is a budding author who has written a history of LGBTQ people in the American military. And if I can um, get your contact information through, I'll get it um, to Arturo, if that would be fine, and uh, get some uh, resources to you, because I don't have them on the tip of my tongue right now. I apologize, but they do exist on the resources that my colleague uses. He, has a, uh, he has a draft book sitting around that's just chock full of those things in there. So I'll be happy to um, make that connection if that'll if that'll be OK. Sure, Sean, thank you so much. And we'll be happy to, of course, share any information that you can give to us, to our faculty or students. Uh, we have just arrived to the end of our event. It's 5 p.m. and it's usually the time when our students go to class. Uh, before returning uh, at the forum to Chris Kojim so he can give the closing remarks, I just want to remind you that the transgender community is a very vulnerable community as well. Um, the suicide rate among transgender people is nearly 10 times that of the national rate. And these numbers have not improved during the pandemic. In fact, they have become much worse during the pandemic. We might call it even a second pandemic. And so if you know someone who's transgender or needs help, please reach out to us. Please reach out to the community. Please reach out to out in national security. Do know that we care for you and we'll welcome you into our community. Chris, would you like to give us our final remarks and remind us about our next events? Uh, thank you, Arturo. And uh, first of all, thanks to Sean. Thank you for uh, a really insightful and, and uh, just a wonderful presentation to help educate all of us on this really important topic. And I thank our participants um, who uh, have stayed with us throughout this hour and, and hung on your every word. And uh, many faculty, of course, and of course, uh, Dean Ayers who has stayed with us uh, throughout the hour. Um, so, as Arturo mentioned, we have distinguished speakers, uh, certainly today, and we will have one tomorrow with H.R. Uh, McMaster, former National Security Advisor, will be joining us. Hope all of you will uh, find time to join us again tomorrow. Um, and uh, thank you, Arturo. Thank you, Sean Skelly, and um, we'll see you all soon. And um, take care now. <laughs>